Good evening everyone. Uh, a lot of things are going on where I live at the moment in this building. It uh, is a mystery to me. My eyes are a bit blurry. I have no idea why. I'll have to just... I have cleaned my glasses. In fact, my eyes look better without them. So I'm wondering... I didn't touch these glasses much because they broke two weeks ago. Uh, they're more blurry on than off. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you. This is the mass. Uh, as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop J. Fulton Sheen. As described by Henri Daniel Rops. And from page 84 in the book, which I no longer have in my possession... And I gave you a taster in the end of the last video. This is going to be, I believe, part five. I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, XV, which is 15, in secret, the secret prayers. And I have recorded it at the end of the last video, so I believe you've heard this, but I... It is the beginning of something it has to be part of. In secret, the secret prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell, Satan, and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. The Secret Prayers The third portion of the Mass is over. I have prayed. I have listened. I have made my offering. The priest now kisses the altar and urgently begs the congregation to unite themselves with him in order to take part in his offering. And here it is that he seems to pause in what he is doing, that he may make a final and most pressing appeal to them before he proceeds to the consecration. He does this in the words of a medieval prayer, the Orate Fratres, which is a sort of long drawn out Oremus. It expresses in marvellous fashion the full sense of this. His final injunction to the bystanders to join with heartfelt sincerity in what he is about to do. This sacrificial act of mine is yours as well. It is as though he said, Be mindful that I do not make this offering alone, but together with you. And it is as if in answer to this appeal that we have at this point in the Mass the second of the three great imprecatory invocations the secrets the others being the collects and the post communions of great antiquity harking back to the same age as the collect which it resembles also in style 
the secret is like it addressed to the triune God in unity on behalf of the whole body of Christians. Why is it called secreta? Is it as if by contrast to the collect, the prayer of the plebs? Collecta. There is here signified the prayer proper to the chosen ones, to the faithful, as distinct from the greater assembly which had at an earlier point in the Mass included the Catechumens as well. Catechumens as well. Or should it rather be taken as having reference to the oblations of bread and wine, which are now set apart or secreteda, secreted, and it's got a little too near it, from the other offerings? Or does this name indicate that we here have a prayer of introduction to the secret things, to the king's mysteries? Whatever be the historical origin of the term, it is now generally translated as the prayer said in secret, for it is most quietly that the celebrant enunciates these words, as if to suggest that having now entered into the Holy of Holies. The priest, even though the representative and messenger of the people, is nevertheless in his function set apart from them. The straightforward and telling phrases of the secret prayer vary according to the mass proper, which is being used, and they express the characteristic spirit of the day being celebrated. In accordance with that, ascensional or upward striving, note which marks the progress of the liturgical action from the beginning of the offertory. These prayers give evidence when they are contrasted with the collects of an increase in fervour and assurance. They all display one grand dominating idea. I know that these fruits of the earth which are my gift to God, will be returned to me after they have been touched by the fecund blessing of his inexhaustibly bounteous hand. I know that they are my pledge or earnest of heaven and of everlasting life which he will give me. Continuing, this is the Mass, from page 87, as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen in 1958 and described by Henri Daniel Rops. Quietly do I murmur this prayer as it bespeaks the feelings of my innermost heart it is a song of hope and of comfort as I struggle with dark and oppressive fears. My Lord, well do I know that my gift to you is less than nothing, 
being but a morsel of bread and a few drops of wine poured into your cup, while nothing could be less worthy of being accepted by you than my own miserable self. But will you dwell upon the worth of what is offered to you? When weighed in the balance with you, what is there but will be found wanting? It is only the upward thrust of joyous confidence holding out these trifling gifts to you. It is only the plea of faith that begs you to accept them, that finds favour in your sight. I know that in return for a single grain of wheat you can grant a most abundant harvest. For one word spoken in mercy, the fullness of your all-embracing pardon for a simple draught of cold water given in your name, that living water which quenches underlying thirst, and that to him who takes up and bears your cross, you will grant Gilead's balm. Therefore, my Lord, as in singleness of heart, and full generously, I offer you all that I have been, all that I am, and all that I shall become. I know that your boundless love will enrich me a thousandfold with peace, with true happiness, and with hope. Continuing XV1 16. This is the Mass from page 88 as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, described by Henri Daniel Wops. The title, The Prologue to the Great Thanksgiving, The Preface. We are approaching the climax of our worship as we begin that great prayer which now initiates the sacrificial part of the Mass. The true re-enactment of the sacrifice of the cross. We are come to the canon. That is to say, as this Greek word tells us, to the part of the ceremony which is the rule and measure of it all, determining its lines and its whole meaning of great iniquity and stemming indeed directly from that last supper which it reproduces. This action, to use the term which the early Christians employed, gives us pause, both by reason of its architectonic magnificence and because of the stately simplicity of its formularies. The canon can be divided into seven sections, of which the consecration is the focal point. Now the priest cries out to all the people, Susum corda, lift up your hearts. This is the moment when your thoughts should be set on God 
alone. The celebrant stands with uplifted hands as though he would bear aloft the compelling expectation of the congregation. With one voice, the people acclaim the Lord on whom their hearts are fixed. This is just what was anciently done in the old church of Africa in the days of that great and holy bishop, Cyprian of Carthage. The gospel tells us that before he blessed the wine of the supper, Christ our Lord gave thanks to God. And this is indeed so essential a part of our worship that the word Eucharist, which describes it, has come to be used of the whole sacrifice itself. Therefore, is it that with the giving of thanks is begun the action which is the very heart of the Mass? First of all, the celebrant says, or rather, he declares, he declaims the preface. How aptly does this word, which has been in use since the third century, convey the purpose of this prayer. The preface is the introduction to the sacrifice. The Eucharistic prologue, the thanksgiving which according to the institution of Christ must precede the consecration. It is moreover a reminder to us of those elaborate and abundant extemporaneous prayers which in primitive times faith and love brought to birth on the lips of the officiant. In modern times there has been a tendency to think of the preface as being separate from the canon, but it may truly be felt that to that canon is intimately linked this prayer, so pure in its style that it seems to have been born in the depths of the human heart and thence to thrust itself upward to the summit which is God. The Greek and the Armenian churches have but one preface to be used throughout the entire year, while in Rome there used to be a different one for each day. This principle of the variable preface is now maintained in the 15 which our modern missal retains in accommodation to the varying seasons and feasts of the liturgical year. All of them are constructed in similar form and style and show that they are rooted in the same motivation. They stress that the sacrifice if offered to God the Lord Almighty and that this is done by and in the name of Jesus Christ. Each of the prefaces in its turn recalls what it is that has been done by him to effect our salvation. For the very reason that the preface thus touches in its intention upon what is by nature ineffable. It is fitting 
that the angels of the heavenly court be called upon to join with us in it. And they are accordingly invoked to the greater glory of God. Continuing, this is the Mass from page 91 as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen described by Henry Daniel Rops. Can you now impel yourself, my heart, above your own concerns and rise to the things of God? Consider what hours you allot each day to the perishing wrecks of time and how brief is your vigil for everlasting life. The moment has come to be still. It is now that in fullness of heart and with confidence unbounded, you must draw apart and impel yourself upward. For this much you know, these mystic rites are your own. They are the very life of your life. This you know. There can be no treater, no truer joy for you than the joy born of this divine confrontation. This you know, the Son of God, in taking flesh from the womb of the Virgin Mary, in freely becoming the mother of sorrows. The man God, in deigning to live your life, to share with you the pangs of mortal death, to come even as you shall to the tomb. All this they did, as you know, only for you. All this indeed you know. Yet it is only in the long-awaited fulfilment of heavenly union that the rich floods of this knowing shall water the dry ground of your selfhood's uttermost limit. Continuing, this is the Mass from page 95, as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, as described by Henri Daniel Rops. When I ponder within my Heart, my Lord, on your glory and on the limitless power that lies within your hands. When I consider the vastness of your creation and peer into endless vistas of space, when I recollect that behind all that is, behind all that has been you, you are. When I reflect that for uncounted aeons of years your spirit has hovered unsearchably over the destiny of men, then do I ask, how, even were all the angelic choirs to lend me their voices, that I might more worthily hymn your unexampled holiness? Then do I ask, as I bend in love, 
while my mind reels before the unfathomed mystery of your nature. Then do I ask how it can be that you centering in yourself the perfection of all glory, nevertheless regard my nothingness? How is it that you are mindful of me and reveal to me the secret of yourself and all your being as you suffer a drop of your divine blood to fall on the face of a sinner? Continuing, this is the Mass from page 99, as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Shreen, described by Henri Daniel Rops. Before I move on, I must pull the second book, because... Um, it's possible that I may need to read a little of it to end this video. So I'm going to put one book on top of the other. These are going to my grandson Jude when I've recorded them. So, um, from page 99. Lord, all we stand here in your sight. We, your witnesses throughout the world, united in the brotherhood of faith and of hope. All we, Lord, who in your holy will and grace are sons of the church you so deeply love. Here is your vicar who most fully bears in your name the burden and care of all the churches. Here is your flock, men, good and bad, the strong of heart and those who are fearful, all come together to wait your blessing. And by their side, stand those who even now do look upon your face. Here are your apostles, your martyrs, your beloved, your chosen ones. In sacramental union, they are one with us, despite our failings and our sinfulness. They join to our offering the fellowship of the saints. All we are here agonizing Jesus, seeing you torn with the bitterness of an unmerited pain and woe. We are here in the certain hope that by your word the bread and the wine we offer are made the earnest of our redemption. Now, Lord, we pray that just as in that final moment of your earthly life you gazed in love on Mary and John. You will now turn your face to your whole church, standing with heart overflowing in love and supplication beside the cross whereon your sacrifice 
is wrought. This is the Mass, continued from page 92, as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, described by Henri Daniel Rops. XV11, 17. Sanctus, 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 the threefold acclamation to the All Holy. How stupendous is the glory of God! And it is with impetuous violence that this hymn, with its thrice repeated acclamation, brusquely breaks in upon the flowing periods of the great prayer of thanksgiving. The celebrant bows low. The little bell is pealed. Three times and I've actually got a little bell today. God in his holiness brings brightness to the night of our mortal days. Not every one of the ancient liturgy, litur, liturgies knew this hymn, although its institution is attributed to St. Sixtus I, who as Pope introduced it into the Mass, in the second century. Today, it is part of all liturgies, being called the Sanctus among the Latins and Trisagion among the Greeks. It falls into two parts. The first of these brings to mind a mysterious passage in Isaiah, wherein that prophet tells us of his vision of God, 6 verses 1 to 3. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne that towered high above me, the skirts of his robe filling the temple. Above it rose the figures of the seraphim, each of them six-winged, with two wings they veiled God's face with two. His feet and the other two kept them poised in flight, and ever the same words passed between them. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. All the earth is full of his glory. It is in recollection of our heritage from that old Israel of promise that we Christians still make liturgical use of the Hebrew word Sabaoth as we sing to the Lord of hosts. The second part of the hymn takes up the same theme and calls upon the powers of heaven to help us in glorifying the one Lord. Does not the Hosanna in Excelsis recall the song of the angels at Bethlehem on Christmas night? And here is a reference to Christ. For this Hosanna, another Hebrew word, is followed by the very formulary men used to salute the Messiah of, at his solemn entry 
into the holy city. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mark 11 verses 9 to 10. Now is God in man made manifest, truly come among us, as the words of this hymn are said? He enters into the core of this sacramental action, just as aforetime he came into Jerusalem, there to ascend his throne, the throne of the cross. Continuing, this is the Mass from page 96 as celebrated by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen in 1958 described by Henri Daniel Rops and the title is XV111 18 The Church at the foot of the cross. The remembrance of the living. Te ig, ig itur. Wherefore, O most merciful Father, we humbly beseech you, through your Son Jesus Christ our Lord, that you would be pleased to receive these gifts, these presented offerings, it is in these words that the brilliant interruption made by the Sanctus in the unfolding of the ideas first expressed in the preface is bridged over as the word igituri indicates in order that there may be resumed the series of prayers leading directly to the consecration, here indeed begins the canon, strictly so called, and it was this consideration which moved the miniaturists of the Middle Ages to paint the initial letter T of Te in such wondrous style. How well does this letter figure the cross? And it is in fact the origin of those crucifixion scenes which are found in most missals at this point in the text. The hour of the sacrifice has come. The celebrant now moves more solemnly hitherto. All his motions are charged with a consciousness of their mystic meaning as he progresses from action to action. Now joining his hands, now raising his eyes to heaven, again kissing the altar once more and then having made the threefold sign of the cross over the oblata he finally extends his hands palms down over the chalice and the host in the manner of one who gives testimony under oath. There are five prayers said in a low voice before the consecration of the elements. Their sequence is not wholly smooth, nor is it devoid of awkwardness, and interruption, for they are the result of a series of dislocations and developments covering several centuries. For example, the first of them, Te Igitur, and the last, 
quam oblationem. Oblationem belong most certainly to the canon in its very oldest form. The list of saints who are called to memory in the communicants dates from the 3rd century, while other parts and phrases can be fixed at about the 6th century, with the exception of the Hank Igatur, which is even later. Nevertheless, it is one grand and overruling idea of thought we find here. It is that of the fellowship or communion of all Christians in God. As Christ now makes ready to mount the cross. The priest states the full purpose of the sacrifice which is offered for the salvation of the church militant on earth and to the glory of the church triumphant in heaven he now calls forth and ranges round about the altar the whole company of baptized Christians their leaders and exemplars at their head he calls forth all who suffered and strove here below to lengthen the blessed shadow which the cross casts over the sins of the world. And he calls as well on those who are now sharers in that glory to which we look. In the first place stands the glorious Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, the Consoler of Men. As a matter of fact, the whole Christian community. The word familia is actually used, is conceived of us being now assembled here where the sacrificial prayer is making into a present reality the rapidly approaching moment when, by transubstantiation, the whole substance of the offerings will become the whole substance of the body and blood of Christ our Lord. I will share a short beginning of X1X from page 100. This is my body, the elevation of the host. This will how I will begin the next part, but I'm going to do a little of it at the end of this part, which I've been doing for the last two or, or so recordings. This is the Mass, page 100, as celebrated in 1958 by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, described by Henri Daniel Rops. X, 1, X, 10, 1 and 10. This is my body, the elevation of the host. Vain is every attempt to explain on merely historical grounds the significant signification 
of this high liturgical act, which is the very culmination of the Mass. The Church says nothing of herself, but hiding herself behind the person of the Christ, uses no words, employs no gestures, but his own. The consecration and the supper are one. The consecration reproduces and extends the mystic memorial of the Last Supper when Jesus, who was facing betrayal and death, freely offered his body and his blood for the redemption of mankind. In this lies the essence of the Mass as it has existed from the days of the early Christians. For the book of the Acts and the apostolic letters offer more than one testimonial to its celebration. In the beginning of this rite was joined that of the Fraternal Supper, the agape or love feast of the community, that out of respect for the holier rite the connection between it and the agape was broken at about the end of the first century. Christ, therefore, is seen to be the author of the form, the actions, the very words of the consecration. In this moment, the priest quite literally becomes Christ himself. His own personality is blotted out. It is absorbed in that of the everlasting priest who is at one time the offered victim and the supreme officiant. For this reason, it is our Lord's own movements, as reported by the Gospel, which determine what the priest does, just as the Master did. The celebrant now raises his eyes on high. As Jesus bless the bread, so does he. The genuflection which the priest inserts here is no more than a personal manifestation of his adoration of God now, sacramentally present. The words too which the celebrant says are words used by Jesus, those great and wondrous words. As Saint Athanasius called them those words, which in their simple directness offer a contrast to the rich formularies wherein they are enshrined. It is as though God would show that he has no need for a multiplicity of verbiage. Nevertheless, what we have in the liturgical formularies is no merely textual reproduction of the evangelical account. Something has been added in the course of the centuries. Such are certain adjectives as those which describe the hands of our Lord as Sanctas ac venerabiles, holy and worthy of respect, or the word inspired by Psalm 22 verse 5, by which the chalice is called.
praeclarum, or glorious. None of these additions is of much importance. Since the medieval period, we find in the midst of the consecratory formula for the wine the words Mysterium Fidei, the mystery or sacrament of faith. Their meaning is that here shines forth the essence of the Christian faith. For now truly, really, substantially, such as the Tridentine terminology, the bread and the wine are become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It is because of the greatness of this mystery that it has been so panoplied with solemnity. Especially has this been so since the 12th century when heresy cast doubt upon the real presence, the thrice rung bell. the clouds of incense, the lighting of a third candle, all are tributes to the Holy Presence. Particularly does the elevation affirm this presence in a magnificent gesture which at once raises to heaven and shows to the whole congregation the bread which has become the body of Christ. Before bowing down in profound adoration, the devout soul looks up in fullness of faith and hope at the little host which fails the greatest of all mysteries. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be continuing and repeating that at the beginning of the next video. I'm going to turn this off. Thank you and God bless.